Father, thank you for your son. We eagerly anticipate his return. Lord, what a glorious reality is the gospel for all who believe. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you for the new life that we have in you that we've been seeing unfolded before us in Colossians. And as we look yet again to your word this morning, I pray that we would have soft hearts to see what we must about you, that we would have moldable lives to conform to the image of Christ, to live in light of the union that we have with him for the glory of your name. And Lord, we are so grateful for the immense privilege that it is to do so, to live for you. And so we ask these things in Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. You can open up your Bible to the book of Colossians. Colossians, we're going to be in chapter 4 this morning, working through verses 2 through 6. Colossians chapter 4. As you're turning there, there was a man by the name of John Harper. He was born in a Christian home in Scotland in 1872. The Lord saved Harper around the age of 14, and at the age of 17, Harper began preaching down the streets of his village. In 1896, Harper started his own church, beginning with 25 members, and 13 years later, the church had grown to over 500. During this time, Harper both married and widowed, and in his marriage, the Lord granted to him a daughter by the name of Nana. Harper became well known for his fervent and faithful evangelism, and he was asked to come to America to Moody Church in Chicago for a series of meetings. He did this, and they went especially well. So well that a few years later, he was asked to come back again. And so Harper boarded a ship from Southampton, England, for the voyage to America, America, and Harper brought his daughter, Nana. And a few nights into the journey, he woke her up at about midnight as the ship had collided with an iceberg. Harper told Nana that another ship was just about to rescue them, but he went ahead and put her on a lifeboat with her older cousin. Well, little Nana was saved, but the ship they were on was the Titanic. We know what happened next because in a prayer meeting in Hamilton, Ontario, months later, a young Scotsman stood up and told a story of how he was converted. He was on the Titanic as well and had clung to a piece of debris in the freezing waters, and suddenly he said, a wave brought a man near. It was John Harper. John Harper called out to this man, man, are you saved? He yelled. The man replied, no, I am not. He shouted back, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The waves took Harper away, but a little later, he was washed back beside the man again. He called out yet again, are you saved now? <laughs> no, the man answered. To which Harper replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then losing his hold of the wood he was holding on to, Harper sank and went to be with his Savior. The man shared that that night he trusted Christ as his Savior. And there was Harper's last convert. Only the work of Christ in one's life can make one's last breaths be concerned for another's eternity. There Harper was about to face his Savior and the burden of his heart towards complete strangers, was a calling out, are you saved? Harper's concern during his last moments were no different than the pattern of his concerns prior to his last moments. 
And this is what an understanding of the greatness of Jesus produces. It's what it should produce. You see, the way that Harper lived in those last moments was no different than how he lived his life. He had an unwavering concern for souls to know Jesus. This is what an understanding of the greatness of Jesus produces. It's what it should produce. And if you remember the theme of Colossians that we began with, a few months ago, that an unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, it fortifies faith and enables faithfulness in the believer. And Paul has set forth the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ, and this realization and this embracing of Christ is to fortify the faith of the believer and is to produce faithfulness in the believer. And in this, the believer is enabled towards a life that is unified with Christ, seeking to glorify Christ. The believer is to manifest outwardly what is true for them spiritually and that they are united with Christ. And so one's union with Christ, one's salvation because of Christ, produces change in that individual, in that believer. The believer is enabled towards faithfulness to God as they are unified with Christ in this new man life that they are granted. We've been seeing all of the ways that union with Christ impacts the believer and is to manifest itself in the believer's life. And now we, this morning we are going to see the outward focused soul that has been impacted and united with Christ. There is absolutely a tension on the inward dealings of the heart in one who is saved by the grace of God. But there is also a passion for others to know this great Savior that has granted to them reconciliation and new life. So there is an inward focus on character and conduct and virtue and holiness. And there is an outward focus in sharing the good news of the gospel with those with whom you come in contact. There is an outward focus concerned with gospel progress, and this is to be the desire of the new man. Paul is bringing a close to his instruction for the Colossians regarding their new man living, and this morning we're going to see his parting burden, his closing instruction for gospel progress. Let's look together this morning. We're going to start in chapter 4, verse 2. We'll go through verse 6. Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Paul's parting burden for gospel progress consists of two necessary priorities for the believer. Paul's parting burden for gospel progress consists of two necessary priorities for the believer. Paul has some final exhortations for the Colossians. This is what he wants to leave them with. This is the parting burden on his heart. This is what he wants impressed on their hearts and minds. And he has been setting forth the new priorities of the new man. Showing them what it means to walk in Christ, to walk and live in light of your union with Christ, and has been addressing their personal character and their interactions with fellow believers. And as we saw last week, their home lives. And now he's going to hone in on two priorities that are necessary in every believer's life in light of their union with Christ. These are staples of the Christian life, they are on Paul's heart for the Colossian believers. And these two priorities actually both center on one consuming desire or burden. And that is the furtherance of the gospel. Gospel progress. That is what was on Paul's heart. This unswerving desire for the gospel to be made known. 
in the world. And this is the call for every believer. Jesus' great commission left to his disciples was a call for the church as well to make disciples. And this is both the privilege and the obligation for every believer. So as Paul is closing this instructive portion of this letter, he cannot leave unaddressed the Christian's call for outward-focused behavior, outward-focused living in light of there being a new creation in Christ. So he is leaving the Colossians with these gospel-progressing priorities, these two priorities that the Christian is to have is this, a devotion to prayer and an intentional witness. A devotion to prayer and an intentional witness. And first we're going to look at number one, the necessary priority of a devotion to prayer. And we see this in verses two through four, a devotion to prayer. The primary command in this passage is right at the beginning of verse two. Look at it again. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. The command here is to devote. This command is the, in the present tense, meaning that it calls for a, a steady, faithful, regular, habitual practice. And so this devotion is to be continual. Paul here has in mind when he says to devote at its most basic form to be steadfast or, or to be patient or to endure in. It's where you persist even if there are challenges or difficulties. It's to be intentionally engaged in. It's to give habitual attention to something. It is to be tenacious towards something, devoted to it, to be unrelenting. There is a devotion, and to what does this devotion do? It is to prayer, a tenacity to prayer, an unrelentingness towards prayer. A faithfulness in prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. And if you're unfamiliar with what prayer is, prayer here is simply a, a petitioning of God. A petitioning of God. But Paul Bunyan has a helpful definition of prayer where he expounds on this idea and gives more detail. It's up for you on the screen there. John, did I say Paul Bunyan? You guys are so gracious. Nobody was, nobody was laughing till I brought it up. The famous lumberjack once said. So I actually wrote Paul Bunyan. But then under it, what did I put on the notes? Oh, phew. Okay. All right. Good luck reining this in now. John Bunyan. John said, prayer is a sincere, sensible affectionate, pouring out of the heart or soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit for such things as God has promised or according to his word for the good of the church with submission and faith to the will of God. What a helpful thought when considering our prayer life. Here, Paul is instructing for the believer to have a devotion to prayer. And the instruction or command is, is to, to devote yourself to prayer, to be persistent in it, faithful in it, unrelenting in petitioning God. When you think about the things that are habitual or regular in your life, the things you are devoted to, where does prayer fit in? It should have a prominent place in each one of our lives. Now, Paul's going to get to the content of the prayer in a moment, but first he's going to describe what should be taking place in prayer. Look again at verse 2. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Give constant attention or devotion to petitioning God with an alertness with a, 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 and a thankfulness. Be alert or watchful. In prayer, be watchful. Don't be sluggish. Don't be lax. Don't be sleepy. Don't be lethargic in your prayer. But rather, Paul is saying, be devoted to prayer, and in your devotion, be watchful. Be on the alert. But, but watchful regarding what? 
alertful regarding what? Well, with thanksgiving. Be alert in it, that is, in your prayer, with thanksgiving. All things for the believer are to be done with thankfulness and prayer. We saw that previously, and this is absolutely included in that. All things are to be done with thankfulness, and prayer is absolutely included in that. In fact, there is an alertness in prayer towards thankfulness. Be alert against ingratitude and to thankfulness in your prayers. And Paul doesn't go into the specifics of what that object of thankfulness is to be. But believers are always to be grateful before the Lord. And we always have something to give thanks for before the Lord. Even the opportunity to pray is something for which to give thanks. To be grateful for evangelistic opportunities. To be thankful to participate in the work of God. Thankful that someone brought you the gospel. Be thankful that God participates actively in your gospel proclamation, in your evangelistic endeavors. And of course, there's a whole slew of things to give God thanks for and the believers to be alert in their prayers with thanksgiving. And just think for a moment about the implications of a heart of thanksgiving on your prayers. When you come with a primary disposition of gratitude, how will that flavor your requests to God? When you recognize that all you you have in Christ is undeserved and a tremendous gift that will bring about eternal joy in the presence of your Savior, any activity that you might participate in will be radically impacted if you've shepherded your heart towards thankfulness as you make your requests to God. Prayers for endurance in the midst of trials are shaded to not with a discontent heart complain to God about your trials, but with a thankful heart seek the Lord to be honoring to him in your trials. Or particularly, as we're seeing here in your gospel proclamation, to not primarily have easy, non-consequential opportunities to proclaim Christ, but that you would have an abundance of ability and opportunities to proclaim Christ with clarity that people might come to know him. Or to submit our requests with thankfulness. We're to be on alert towards that. Well, in verse 3, Paul now is going to reveal the content that is on his mind regarding this call to persistent prayer. Look at verse 3. Paul says, praying at the same time for us as well. Paul is instructing them to pray, and in their prayers now, he is asking that they also pray for him, but He asks that they pray for us as well, or for us also, is what he's saying. And he goes into what he wants them to pray for also. The example of what Paul sets forth, his request, is what he wants them to pray for him also, meaning pray this for yourselves and pray this for us also. This indicates that what Paul is asking for them to pray for him also is what they are expected to be praying for themselves. Pray for these things for yourselves, but pray for us also these prayers. The burden on Paul's heart expressed through his request for prayer is also to be the prayerful burden on the Colossians' hearts and now ours also. And then Paul gives the content of the prayer. Look again at verse 3. He says, praying at the same same time for us as well, that God will open open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. Paul starts with that God will open up to us a door for the word. Paul is requesting an opportunity to speak the message of the gospel, the word. A couple thoughts on this. 
Paul's not asking for opportunities for gospel proclamation that won't create difficulty for himself. He's not in this request praying for someone to say just the right thing so that he'll feel comfortable sharing the gospel. Paul's writing from prison, and in his request for opportunity, he's being restricted from whom he can be around, and he is wanting those restrictions removed or overcome that God would give him opportunity to share his word, to share the truth of the gospel. And Paul recognizes that God is intimately involved in the work of his people and is requesting divine assistance to have opportunity to speak forth the message of the gospel. And remember, the command is to be devoted to these kinds of prayers. Vigilance, to pray that God would open doors to proclaim the gospel. And what's amazing is if you remember in Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, I want you to know that my imprisonment, he's writing from prison, praying for opportunities, asking for prayers for opportunities to proclaim the word. And he tells the Philippians that his imprisonment has actually turned out in a furtherance, a greater furtherance of the gospel and the cause of Christ being known among the whole Praetorian Guard as well as others. You see, Paul is not praying for the absence of opposition, but for the opportunity to share the word, to speak the mystery of Christ. He's asking for opportunities to proclaim the word. That is the burden of his heart. And so it should be us as well. Then he says, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. And Paul has already explained the mystery of Christ or the mystery pertaining to Christ. If you remember Colossians 1.27, where he said, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, that a union with Christ and a hope of glory through him was accessible, not through Jewish conversion, but Gentile inclusion in God's establishing of the church, both Jews and Gentiles, by faith through grace could be saved and have union with Christ in the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God. And so Paul is is desiring here that he wants to make known the mystery, to speak the mystery of Christ. He wants opportunity to share the word so that he can speak forth this this eternity-altering message of the gospel. This work of Christ of salvation that's available to both Jews and Gentiles, where Christ is in you, this astonishing reality must go forth. And it is this very message that is the reason Paul was currently imprisoned. His opposition, his imprisonment didn't deter his commitment and his intentional petitioning of God for more opportunities to proclaim this message. He didn't abandon the message because things got hard for him. He prayed for more opportunities and actually here gives no attention even to the physical consequences on him. He just wants Christ to be made known. He wants the gospel to go forth. Even as he prayed in chapter 1. Then in verse 4, Paul says that, I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul is not only requesting prayers for opportunities, but also that he might make it clear. Paul in this is requesting that when he does speak the word, the mystery of Christ, that he would do so with clarity, that an unveiling would take place in the listeners. And Paul holds side by side what he asked them to pray for and what indeed ought to be. Pray that I might make it clear in the way I ought to speak. The gospel is is powerful. The gospel is clear, and we have an obligation to represent it as it is. We have an obligation to speak and should pray for divine assistance to not mess up this precious, life-transforming, eternity-altering message. Articulate with precision. precision. He wants to make it clear, gospel clarity. 
Do we pray for gospel clarity? God, please give me opportunities to share your gospel and give me clarity when those opportunities come to rightly represent your message. Well, Paul next follows up his command to devote yourselves to prayer, this necessary priority for the believer, with two, two more commands that can be summed up in the next priority, which is, number two, an intentional witness. Paul's parting burden for gospel progress consists of two necessary priorities for the believer. The first was a devotion to prayer, and now number, number two, an intentional witness. We see this in verses 5 and 6. This intentional witness is highlighted by two commands. The first is that they would conduct themselves with wisdom towards outsiders. We see that in verse 5. And that their speech would always be with grace. We see that in verse 6. But first, let's look at what Paul says in verse 5. Look again there. He says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Paul's instruction began with prayer regarding their witness and the furtherance of the gospel, but now he is addressing their ministry to outsiders. That is, those outside of the faith, unbelievers. And Paul begins with the word conduct, or more literally, walk, which is a word we've seen several times. It's the same word he used in chapter 1, verse 10, or chapter 2, verse 6, when he says walk in Christ, and in chapter 3, verse 7, and Again, this is to walk or to conduct yourself or to have the pattern of your life be with wisdom towards outsiders. There is to be a consideration of our conduct or the pattern of our life to be with wisdom among unbelievers towards outsiders. There is to be consideration of our conduct or our walk with every non-believer that it would be done with wisdom. And this wisdom is to characterize the manner of our walk. And we know that all true wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. Paul has made that clear thus far. Therefore, this is to be or to have an ongoing dependence in looking to Christ as we seek to walk in the world and among those not in the faith, that we would navigate our lives and the pattern of our lives with wisdom toward them. That we would be holy and integrous in front of an onlooking world. That we would not be enticed by the world. That we would rather be separate from the world. That we would navigate being around outsiders with diligence, making good choices that honor God, making good use of those times where we interact with outsiders. The conduct of our life is to match the gospel message that we are to proclaim. Watch your lives, because your life and your conduct in and of itself cannot save someone, but it can be an obstacle. It can bring reproach on the name of Christ. If you proclaim the worth of Christ... If you communicate the seriousness of sin and the forgiveness and newness of life found in Christ, but you live just like the one who is not found in Christ, why would anyone think anything of your message except that it is hypocrisy? We must live in light of our union with Christ as we bring the gospel to outsiders. They must see the effects of the gospel, hatred of sin, love and joy and holiness of life. The wonderful reality of fellowship with God that we have the privilege of experiencing as ones who have been forgiven all of our sins, all of our transgressions have been canceled out. The debt of our sin canceled out. Of course our life must look different. Not to merit this saving grace that God has brought to us, but in light of it. This is how we live. And that must be seen. We must conduct ourselves with wisdom. We must be wise. Paul brings further clarity to this instruction regarding conduct with the phrase, making the most of the opportunity. This is literally the, re the time redeeming. This means to snatch up every opportunity. Listen, you will have an infinite amount of time 
to enjoy and worship God in eternity, and we should enjoy and worship God now, yet you have a finite time to proclaim the gospel to outside unbelievers, which is also an expression of worship to God. We have a finite time to proclaim the gospel 70, 80, 90 years only on this earth. We need to make the most. Snatch up each opportunity to conduct yourself with outsiders well. Live consistently with your message and position yourself intentionally with wisdom that you can make the most, that you can redeem the time with outsiders. Your neighbor, that you've been having casual conversations with, waiting for the right time to share the gospel with them. What if they got in a car crash and didn't come home tomorrow? When you give an account for the time under your stewardship on this earth, what will that account be? Will you have conducted yourself with wisdom? And listen, this isn't to heap guilt on missed opportunities, but to drive us to see the urgency of the ones the Lord has yet to bring and to pursue with boldness and courage and intentionality in those circumstances to come, gospel progress, gospel proclamation. Let your witness be displayed through your wise conduct among those God has not yet saved. Does your conduct display a winsomeness in your work? Your life, your integrity, your speech, your social media presence, your relationships. Is your walk a wise walk? Listen, you can have all the right outward priorities and convictions, be concerned with all the right things, and completely miss the mark by poor conduct in how you hold and advocate for those things. Having the right convictions is not enough. You need to be wise in how you conduct yourself with those things. Then in verse 6, Paul shifts specifically to our speech. Look at verse 6. Paul says, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. See, Paul understands the connection between our walk, our conduct, and our speech. And so Paul says, let your speech always be with grace. And this expands the command, not only to when we proclaim the gospel specifically, although it certainly includes that, but also our daily routine interactions with non-believers, our speech among a watching world is to always be with grace. There is to be a constant vigilance in our conversations with the unbelieving. Every word matters and must rise to this call. Every word should be with grace. That is, they are to be permeated with, empowered by, and engulfed in the grace that the Holy Spirit empowers. To have our words full of grace means there is an attractiveness or graciousness. They are pleasant to the hearers. And we know that the gospel is offensive to those who are perishing, and that's not what Paul is getting at here. See, he's he's not only talking about the specific content, but the manner of our speech as well. There is not to be an undue harshness or an arrogance in our speech with non-believers. We aren't to be biblical bullies. Our words are to be thoughtful, intentional, gracious. And, And graciousness also doesn't mean passive or unclear or vague in order to not offend. Paul is praying for an open door to share the gospel with clarity. 
but rather Paul is getting at a godliness in our speech, both of the content and the manner in which we speak. Look at what Paul says next. He says, as though seasoned with salt, and this is what he means by our words being with grace. Our speech is to be palatable and thus beneficial to outsiders. Our speech is to be winsome, and it's not the response of the unbeliever that dictates this. It's not their response that is in mind, but their profit spiritually. It's not not being intentionally inflammatory or, or speaking carelessly to be misunderstood. Rather, it's with clarity advocating for what is right in humility. You're speaking the truth with courage and clarity, but you're being godly in your presentation of these realities. Our speech is not to be self-governing, but is to be under control. And Paul closes this thought saying, look at the end of verse 6, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Be gracious in your speech, seasoned with salt, so that you might answer each question posed in the right way. Do you ever not share the gospel because you're intimidated or afraid that you won't have the right response? I I don't know what they're going to say. I might not respond rightly. I, I I might mess it up. That's understandable. There's something commendable in not wanting to mess up the gospel, right? Paul prays for clarity with the message. Yet Paul is saying, be gracious in your speech and have your speech be salty or distinct. And then the purpose or the result of that is so that you will know how to respond. The call here is not simply to know the right words and routinely go through the motions, but to have an awareness of the soul in front of you and wisdom to navigate each encounter with grace, knowing how you ought to respond, that you would please God, that you would be winsome, not bringing reproach on the name of Christ. There's not a routine statement of responses, but rather have your speech be so gracious, be Be full of grace-giving words that are faithful to the truth and your words are distinct. There's a stark contrast in what you say and how you say it from how the world would respond and conduct themselves. And when you do those things, the result that will actually come to pass is that your response will be personal, timely, And a need of the moment response for that particular person. You can have faith in God that when your focus is that your words are grace grace giving, gracious, tasty, seasoned, that God will give you what you need to say. Our responsibility isn't to have an answer for every single objection, but to be able to clearly give a response for the hope that we have in Christ. If you can share the gospel, you can do this. If you know the gospel, you can do this. We should grow. As long as we are alive, we will grow for eternity in understanding to greater depths the richness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we should endeavor to do that, to fortify and strengthen our understanding of God's word. And yet we don't have to wait till we arrive at some sort of position to be able to open our mouths, to be able to live godly lives in front of the world, to be able to proclaim the richness of who Christ is and what he has done in the gospel. We need real-time, spirit-given wisdom and grace to be acted upon in the specifics of each encounter with the unbeliever. To know how to respond to each person, this requires careful listening, cultivated humility. You're more concerned with that person's spiritual well-being and edification in that moment than making your point. 
Let me ask you this. Are, are you willing to concede issues that don't pertain to the gospel in graciousness in order to be winsome with the gospel? What do I mean by that? Not, not lie, not deceive, not misrepresent yourself. That's not what I mean at all. But are you willing to not get bogged down in a debate about peripheral things, even if you're convinced you're right, so that you might be holy in your conduct, different from the world, pleasing to God, gracious in your speech as you put forth the actual message that can transform Do you rely on your mental understanding of the gospel and your confidence to articulate various theological realities or do you humbly, dependently look to spirit-empowered grace filled speech that is distinct from the world in your articulation as you proclaim those truths that we are to love? It is an immense, wonderful, incomparable privilege to be ambassadors for Christ, to bring this message that is not our own, that is precious and life-giving. We must be faithful to this. We must have this burden that Paul has for gospel progress. We must have a burden for souls that they would be rescued from hell, that they would know this wonderful Savior who is supreme and sufficient for all that we need. Do you know this Savior? Do you know Christ? Have you yielded to him in faith and repentance? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know him now? Do you know him now? Let us be intentional. Let us make the most of the time that we have to proclaim this wonderful message. Let us be full of integrity in our lives and intentionality in our speech that our Savior would be seen as the great God that he is. Let's pray. Lord, the fact that you would Allow us to participate in your glorious cause. It's such a privilege. It's such a joy. Simply to proclaim this message is wonderful. To live consistently in light of your work is wonderful. And then to see dead people made alive, to see newness of life given, to see the old stripped away, to see union with Christ accomplished by your saving grace. Oh, Lord, give us a a passion, a, a burden, a devotion to seek you for your assistance in participating in this work that you are doing. Help us to rightly reflect your greatness in our lives. Help us to rightly proclaim your message with our mouths so that the world would see you, know you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.